Hello, welcome to the Light Reading Podcast. My name is Phil Harvey. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Light Reading, and it's just me podcasting today. Well, not just by myself. Uh, my guest today is Brahim Gideon. He is the, uh, well, I should say was, the CTO of TELUS. Uh, so he's the former CTO of TELUS, uh, just finished his tenure there uh, a few weeks ago. And uh, he's been at TELUS since 2003, so he's going on a little more than 20 years uh, at that company. And he's been in the industry even longer. He was formerly with uh, Bell Northern Research, Nortel Networks, and he was even an IC designer engineer at Mitel uh, back in the late 80s, early 90s. So he's seen a lot. He knows a lot of people. Uh, he's been in charge of and observed lots of technology transitions. And we'll talk about a few of those uh, in this interview. Um, I didn't really focus on what he's doing next. I think he'll, uh, you know, talk about that more, uh, you know, in his own sweet time. But I think that uh, it was interesting to uh, kind of go backwards and talk about what kinds of company telecom companies, telecom companies are, um, what they're changing into, what technology transitions have been uh, surprising, which ones have worked, which ones haven't. And uh, I hope you enjoy the interview. It's uh, uh, we go on for about uh, you know about a half an hour, and uh, if you know Brahim, it's uh, that's 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 still relatively short. Uh, he's a he's a, he's easy to talk to and has has a lot to say. So let's get going. Here's Brahim Gideon, uh, former CTO of Telus. Brahim Gideon, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, Phil. My pleasure. It's been a while. It, it has been a while, and uh, although I do I do frequently see you at events, so I, I always get it. I feel like um, even if we haven't stopped and talked, I, I always get a wave or a head nod from you <laughs> as we're as we're passing, uh, you know, in, in our respective schedules and stuff. But um, so uh, let's go with the most obvious uh, direction, which is you announced uh, in November, I think, that you were retiring. Um, yep. What's the When's your last day, and what's the uh, what's the uh, exit strategy at this point? I had my last day. Like, there's been a like when you leave on very happy terms. There's like multiple offboarding dates. Oh yeah, so yeah, yeah. good. My my email is disabled. Uh, effective last Friday. So uh, okay, I think a bunch of stuff is just in the air, but it's been a very happy. Uh, separation or departure on both sides right so it's, yeah it hasn't been the we need to seize the guy's assets and uh, walk him out of the building I'm, <laughs> that's uh, right <laughs> it's nice when they're uh, offering you cake as opposed to handing you a box <laughs> it, it, i mean uh, 20 years has been really amazing uh, yeah. a couple of things as i shared with you privately hit like uh time to do something else right it would be now right like uh, at a certain point uh yeah and uh, it was great opportunity with Telus doing a whole bunch of optimizations to to uh, optimize my piece and then include myself on in the optimizations. Right. So I thought right. it was pretty good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a it, it it's a, yeah. I was about to say if you're if you're if you're part of the fix, I guess that helps <laughs> helps it all go go down. Um, what? Uh, Okay, so last day's already happened. Uh, nice transition. How long has this been in the works? Like, how long have you been contemplating, you know, your next steps and kind of what? And, and then, do you want to talk publicly about what you're doing next or what you're thinking about doing next? So, people would guess it's been since before, probably around Mobile World Congress, when I felt our industry's got a bit of a <laughs> depression last year. And I've been rationaling it with my boss uh, and a bunch of colleagues for a while. And then uh, the opportunity time, the opportune time was August-ish. Mm -hmm. and, and we waited to announce it till November. That was one of the agreements that uh, tell us control the time and when and the media. So uh, sure. as I said, it was a really happy uh, departure. They made a really cool book for me on 20-year legacy at TELUS. So yeah. <laughs> it's Pretty remarkable. I'm thinking back, you know, over 20 years, it's been, um, there's a, I mean, there's a, just a menagerie of different technologies you've uh, either helped usher in or commented on or had something to do with, you know, is, is in the CTO role at TELUS and, and also just, you know, kind of your visibility in the industry. Um, what I've always liked about the way you approach the CTO job is you, uh, 
And you told me this once, and I've seen it in print a time or two where you've said, I'm basically just a geek who can articulate what he's doing very well. Um, <laughs> would you, would you kind of say that's still the, 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 uh, bottom line expectation for a CTO these days? Well, I, I, well, it depends what you want out of your CTO. Do you want well, them yeah, to run yeah. the network? And I think it's not my definition of a CTO. A CTO is supposed to look at a bunch of technology stuff. Like any question you have on your mind, Phil, in theory, I should be able to have a view and then put you in touch with the right folks. And uh, traditionally, it grew from the network area, right? So Right. So, yeah, I mean, we, we got to be geeks, right? Like uh, there's some political CTOs who have engineering degrees but never practiced. They're, some of them are my friends also. Like, But you, you do need to, I think in these times that where the whole industry is struggling, you need to uh, excite people about understanding what they do and empathize and having a yeah. vision around where the technology is going. And, and people like playing with stuff, right? Like... Uh, yeah, I think that's human nature. Um, yeah, I, uh, I, I uh, also uh, it does uh, as a journalist. Uh, it irks me slightly when I go to a CEO and they don't have an opinion about a technology <laughs> because I'm like, I'm like, w- w- what are what you know? That's what we're that's what you're here for. Like you're 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 giving us guidance or you're giving us a reaction. And of course, they can be um, they can change their minds. They can you know say, well, it didn't work in this situation, but it'll work in this situation. But uh, it's a surprise. It's, there, there's, it, I'm surprised sometimes when I'll talk to folks in the industry. And maybe it's because they just don't want to talk publicly, but there's sometimes where they just don't have, they're like, yeah, I don't really have an opinion about that. I'm like, well, that's weird. <laughs> uh, I, I, I note that you never suffered from that. But um, I also wanted to ask you, because you know, kind of looking back over your career, what do you think was one of the most challenging technological transitions that ever happened, you know, either while you were at TELUS or, or just in the industry generally uh, o- over your career? Like, what would you say was like one of the, um, w- one of the big ones, you know, that challenged yeah, like, everyone? Like, I think I'm lucky to have done both wireless wireline for the lack of a better word. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I think one of the most technical challenges is how people, uh, did not use IP right to the internet protocol. Mm-hmm. Uh, like there was a lot of fear on, I want to use it as a backhaul or I don't want to understand it. And the industry didn't help. If you look at mobility, right? Like uh, mm-hmm. it was such a miss for us as an industry that uh, in 2000, we were debating whether we need to use ATM and grow it, which is like so stupid if you remember. <laughs> uh, yeah. And it took us till 4G plus to think of this discussion as a single session. I think of a whole base station as an IP session, which is, again, so stupid. Like, it shows how we were, and and being, having been at Nortal also 20 years or so before I was at Telus for 20 years, the vendors promoted it, and they put the fear of God in certain people's eyes. So if you didn't have the... uh, the grid to say, guys, this is stupid. I understand how the internet works. Why is the wireless world yeah. five years behind the internet per se on how they look at sessions, monitor them, and all that stuff, right? Mm-hmm. Like, like we still measure dropped calls and call failed attempts. Okay, but how many of us actually use telephony on TDM or Volte? Like, what a legacy artifact, right? Like, we're all paying so much money uh, when we can use WhatsApp. So you wonder... We're victims of our own uh, conservatism sometimes, right, as telcos. Mm-hmm. Like, we're the ones who didn't go back to the vendor and say, screw you, we're not doing vo- voice over LTE. <laughs> right. But no, yeah, we're no. all so happy we were standardizing. Right. If you look at the cost we paid versus what WhatsApp. Like, why didn't yeah. we use our our business lines use VoIP? Yeah. Which we own. Like, we all have business solutions. Why don't we just go back to the, the vendors? I don't want to name anybody specific. I promised in my retirement from yeah. Telus I'll be a much nicer person. <laughs> but, but like seriously, like we were stupid and they took advantage of us, right? So we did Volte and Vilti and uh, yet all of us were happy using video on Signal or on WhatsApp right. or on uh, my Apple tools. I'm an Android guy, but uh. yeah, yeah, no, I, I, I think Skype and things like that were around at the same time where people were having these, you know, convoluted arguments about, um, you know, why this type of 
uh, networking or infrastructure for video conferencing would be better than this one over here and how, and how this one belonged to one vendor and this one was a little more open and the rest of us are just going, it's just apps, dude, you know, <laughs> like, <laughs> no, but, but it's so true. Like Phil, we we're joking about it, but think about the, uh, think about two things, forget about the cost, right? Like, because we've done all stupid things. So cost is. Just like when you have a bad date, yet you spend a lot of money on the wine. So hopefully you enjoyed the wine. <laughs> right. It's not the end result, but hopefully you enjoyed the wine. Uh, I think there's a lot of lessons learned, but I think the delay of our industry is the travesty. That's the true tragedy. The, the five-year-plus delay, and then all of a sudden, you've emerged in an area where people don't buy from you minutes anymore. Like, we include them, but nobody cares. Right. Like other than my mother who's 92, nobody phones me. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, it's 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 all they've found it, it seems like each generation will find its own preferred modality to communicate. And al almost none of those involve uh tracking or paying telcos more more money, you know, over over and above the plan that they've, you know, uh that they've gotten. And of course the com competition has made it so that all those plans are mostly more or less unlimited these days. Um, so that's a, that's a good, yeah. So these technical transitions were tough. Um, what uh, in, in terms of technology adoption, um, were there any that surprised you along the way? Were there any that made you uh, e either in a good way or a bad way, any things that, that came up in your career that you were like, wow, this is amazing. I hope, I hope this works out or, on the other side, I can't believe we're doing this. This doesn't seem like the right, the right way. I, I, I know we've got a, like, want to keep it short to, to not bore people, but. Uh, <laughs> okay. Give me, a, a give me an answer of, for the podcast and then we'll have one at the bar some, sometime down the road. <laughs> yeah. but, well, there's a couple of things, right? The first one was uh, when we did online charging, like it was the hype on what we needed to do, right? So we implemented online charging and we realized the problem was not the technology, <laughs> Right. Like what was shocking to me because I'm a software guy from Bell Northern Research, Nortel. Right? Sure. Like that's how yeah. I did uh, my work. Uh, it, the issue was uh, it, you find out the massive technical debt that forces you to just stick with your legacy suppliers, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the issue is you had 10,000 plants, of which five were 90% of your population, <laughs> and the other 9,995 plans were used by 5% of your revenue. Right, yeah. And that's become the daunting task. So I, th I think one of the things I'm uh, shocked in the AI world, uh, and that reported to me to tell us when I was there, like really amazing bunch of people and data scientists, I think we need to use AI, like one use case that nobody talks about because it's unsexy. It's to reverse engineer what we've got to move forward. Mm, okay. Like, uh, like, for example... Uh, the some of our my peers have around ninety voicemail features that they maintain for the last sixty years. Right. Okay. Like I tried. Like I was just you know drunk one night enjoying myself. I tried to name ten friggin' features on voicemail. <laughs> I was unable to name more than six. Yeah. But somebody's job is to maintain a hundred, and it comes out in their RFPs and RFIs and the testing and regression testing. So I think you asked me for one specific incident. I think there's a whole bunch of reaffirmed things in my mind that when you get the new stuff, really approach it as a transformative opportunity and maybe go chat. God forbid. Hey, Phil, what three features would you like? I'm giving yeah. you the chance to pick your own Yeah, yeah. versus here's a hundred that you use like one, which right. is what forward and delete is what I use. Yeah. That's the, like when's that's... the last time that you press time of day? It tells you what time of day, like how stupid are you? Do you have to press it again? Yeah. I just listen to it again if I need time of day. <laughs> but that's awesome. a friggin' feature. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Something that's that's programmed into the system that was converted to software that's now fussed about, like you said, in 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 quality control. Like, I, and it's not us. It could be us. It could be my ex, my ex company. I'm still kind of CTO emeritus. It could be us. But some people actually formalize it, like uh, yeah. operator X user. Right. features like what the hell's that like you've just entrenched it there's a department that does this stuff right so yeah so i think that's not one thing it's more of a multitude of things like for example there was only two operators in the world that have voted against non-standalone oh okay <laughs> and we felt if we wanted to be disruptive we should do standalone right 
So, yeah. so we were, we, we abstained, we, we abstained and we said, this is really to embrace 5G. It has to be 5G properly. Right. Cause as soon as you interwork with your legacy, you actually burdened the vendors. Yeah, you have to, you, you have burdened to the help. standards. Right. Yeah. You have to help the legacy along to, to, and then it's never going to, like we've seen with non standalone, um, which by the way, I love the naming convention of telling people things that something doesn't do as part of its name. That's good. Um, <laughs> I never thought of it this way. I just, I just thought we should get the award for the most unimaginative naming. LTE is long term and evolution, <laughs> right? You know, like it's all these stupid names. Like SA is standalone. Yeah. It's a bit of a drought in making us sexy. Yeah, yeah, and it doesn't translate when you start talking to consumers about it. It's hard for them to get excited about it because then you have to explain. So, but, but we're trying. Like this is again yeah. a drought in our ability to articulate. Oh my God, you need five G plus. Right. Oh my, how can I live my life without five G plus? <laughs> it's, like, it's like, well, what does it do for you? I don't know. like. It's like five G. Keep it polite. Not plus much. Something else. <laughs> not, not much, but like you need it. Oh my God, you mean you don't support five G? Like, yeah, like, right. Like, oh like, how, how am I going to find a girlfriend or a boyfriend if I don't have five G logo right. on my phone? Yeah, I, I yeah. got shit from. Uh, John Donovan, who's also the retired CEO of at and yeah. is a good friend of mine. Yeah, yeah. And, and I was telling John, I gave a talk at uh, in the U.S. They just launched their uh, 5GE, 5G enhanced, which is bullshit, of course. <laughs> and I it was I used it as a it's a change of the logo, and I I got shit from him. He's a good friend, but he says, "Yeah, you don't understand marketing." He's probably right, but. Uh, they launch something that doesn't do anything for clients. So, so I right. just call it drought. Like when I first joined Telus, we were launched ADSL2. Like we were marketing ADSL2. Yeah. And then our marketing guy says, oh my God, the real ADS2 plus. Like you're sitting at home. It was like the the lack of empathy from our industry. Right. But it, it it's kind of a supply chain issue, Phil. Yeah. Like it, there's like an industry in the standard. There's lack of empathy in the standards. Right. The vendors push stuff that we kind of just love it. So now everybody's saying, oh, my God, when are you doing 5, five plus G? If you tell our CEO, when are we doing uh, <laughs> 5G plus When are plus. we doing 5G plus plus? <laughs> Double plus. He's still waiting for the stupid <laughs> business case for 5G. Remember, it was going to be like one-tenth of the price. And people right. forget that you need to actually start first, and then you can worry about how much you're saving. It, right, it, yeah. It's I mean, cheaper I per bit. I think we, we misled ourselves. Yeah, it is cheaper per bit. It is much more cost effective. There's no way you're not going to do mid band spectrum as a mobile operator, mm -hmm. but you're you're building new infrastructure. Like I, this is what you like. You are putting an upstream investment. It's not an incremental add. Yeah. So when when we're talking about like you know what technology transitions, it's it's really more about how the industry responds to new technology, sort of how it. How it articulates it, how it markets it, and then and then the fact that up until maybe very recently, it just hasn't connected with the audience that's meant to consume those technologies in a in a good way. Like it it doesn't, like you said, in an empathetic way. It doesn't really, um, it doesn't really, you know. Like I, I actually like what you said about the. It doesn't just go to them and ask them, "What do you want?" You know, <laughs> which of these three features, which of these hundred features, do you you know pick three. Um, because that that would a solve problems, b make them like you better, and then c, um, you know, maybe make it easier to explain. Uh, uh, hey, how did um, you know? Because you're uh, out of the industry, uh, what do you think will happen to? Um, and I'll, I'll call them traditional telecom companies, and I'll just say anybody who you know at one time owned a copper network and charged for voice services. Um, how do you think those companies are going to look and are going to fare in the next few years? Um, you know, what what path do you see them going down? I, I, I think so, so. Very few of us did not diversify, right? Like so. So I, I think like I cannot name anybody who still depends on just telephony and and voice. The only thing that I think, if I may be bold, Phil, not to correct you, but what I think we need to change is how much actual real dollars, like where are your true earnings or profitability out of? And that's probably still likely out of network services, right? Yeah. Like, like we all have a line item called voicemail, but we bundle in. So it's like kind of bullshit to put it as there. Like it's more of a 
Phil expects voicemail. He expects uh, he expects text, and he's expects X amount of gig. Like right. so, so, I think the true company. Now that I'm kind of a pseudo free agent, yeah. I, th- I think the true company for us is what are you consuming? Mm-hmm. What is the currency? If the currency is bits per second, how many of us reports bits per second versus dollars? Okay. And and then and then the other stuff you're assuming it's cost of doing business, just like your BSS stack. Like right. we never report that, right? Like what does it cost to activate a subscriber? Is it five cents? Is it five dollars? That's happening whether the ARPU is ten bucks or a hundred bucks or six bucks. Right. So, so, but I think uh, most of us diversified. I think if you look at a lot of us as what we diversified in, in like, is it tangential or is it orthogonal? So, so, so I can look at what we've done as tell us, and it was more like, okay, we got a really bunch of good engineering teams. We got a great brand. What is the industry that can benefit from great technology and a great brand? That's why we decided to do health. It wasn't like we had an army of physicians or doctors. Right. Uh, we said, okay, we need to inject massive amounts of dollars into the health industry, like uh, uh, the UK and Canada and most of Western Europe, like it's Medicare, it's very social. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then how can you get them the best engineering skills and move that forward? And that's when we said, well, yeah, TELUS can help, right? Uh, then we looked at agriculture a few weeks later. It came out of an MBA case study, right? Like we actually look at these things. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, how do you look at the supply chain? Uh, a lot of our peers wanted to do more with the same, which is tangential. I, I don't know how well they're doing. Like, for example, now I don't want to name names, but most of my peers are trying to sell me their IoT platform. Right. I'm saying, what the hell's an IoT platform? <laughs> like, what are you selling me? Right. Oh, well, you know, you could do this, you can do that. We can save you money, but... I don't think I should spend a penny on IoT, right? Like what I should do is if I'm charging a buck a subscriber a month, what I should do if I'm smart is make sure that my cost at Telus before data is 10 cents. Hmm. That's my IoT platform. <laughs> right. Yeah. So so meaning that if you deliver the network at if you deliver the optimal the optimal network at the optimal price, then all the other services kind of are more a matter of, you know, specialized, you know, tuning it to vertical markets, but not necessarily 100%. saying, you know, se- not necessarily leading with the technology, just sort of leading yeah. with the network. Um, uh, like private wireless network is, is if we're not going to use it transformatively, isn't it a shame, Phil? Like if yeah. we're not going to sit down and leverage things like mobile edge compute, where you have, you can process locally. Mm-hmm. And there's some real use cases I can share with you. And then if we're not going to do that, we're, uh, uh, it, it's, it's stupid. A missed it, opportunity. It's, yeah. It's a hundred percent, but then it's the safe thing. Like let's put non-standalone. Let's yeah. put voice over LTE. Like, like we regressed from Alexander, but we did TDM and then we kept going backwards. We did VoIP. And if you look at the rest of the industry, we've gone backwards on everything since VoIP. <laughs> Right, because we were using the internet, the open internet, and now we're uh, locking it down again. I guess. Um, uh, what, what's the? Um, uh, let's see. Last question. I do want. I do want to wrap up because we uh, do have a, a bit of a time constraint. But uh, um, was there any service uh, or um, thing that the industry started doing that didn't take off that you kind of uh, that you wish had caught on, like? I was always amazed, honestly, that um, that telcos never really, never really got pay TV right, um, or they never really stuck with it long enough. You know, that's that's one. From, it it from looks my like eye. I'm cheating with you because I was going to talk about TV when I joined Telos. We were on our first generation IP TV, right? Which is an Alcatel platform before it became Alcatel Lucent, and right, that wasn't really the greatest. And the cost of acquisition was and a thousand bucks almost to go to the home yeah. and rewire it, where my cable was so simple. It's one to many. Right. And, and I think what didn't take off is two things. And I'll talk about we're on our fourth generation now. So I think now it's taken off. There's a lot of pay TV. Uh, there's a lot of multiple TV platforms across the world. Like we're very successful. We actually have, Atalus has had more net ads than our competitor in region for okay. the last five years. Oh, okay. like it's true digital, it's, it's distributed. It's got all the features you'd expect. Yeah. Uh, but, but I want to talk about the biggest problem is we thought we were competing with cable. 
Mm. We never took advantage of the fact, actually, and our boss would always say, like, our CEO is very vocal. It's you idiots. You, you, you can redefine the space, yet we're trying to put, compete with, like, the best. It's like what I tell people when I, uh, they started learning C++ and object-oriented. I said, don't use it to write C and Fortran. <laughs> I mean, C and Fortran work great for Fortran and C. If right. you're using C++, use it for object-oriented. So, so shame on us. Most of us used IPTV to compete with broadcasts. Stop. Right. It's a mature ecosystem. It's everything. The only thing we realized was IPTV set-top boxes were IP-based. They were so much cheaper. Like there were so many IP chips versus Doxus chips. Right. So that was the first thing, but it took us forever there, and the industry didn't help us. Like, like why, why doesn't Phil want to watch a channel for a day? You can't buy that content. Oh, and uh, my favorite was Fox, right? Like, if you because we all care about sports, right? Like, uh, yep. to care about Fox News, you need to be inclined politically in a certain way, which is not the bulk of Canadians, right? But but they wanted to sell more subscribers, like so they'd use it. Well, if you're taking the Monday Night Football, which is pretty cool for everybody, yeah. oh, you have to take Fox News. Uh, 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 so, so we, we talked about uh, one to many, one to one, which is unicast, and we built our network. So, so we were very lucky that we actually prepped the networks for broadband, for COVID. Actually, we, not, we didn't prepare for COVID, but the right architecture for what the future was, which is one to one, prepared us for COVID. That's why telcos were much more ready than cable codes uh, when it happened for the pandemic, for four people working from home. But, but but I don't want to overstay my welcome, and I want to stay your friend. It, <laughs> but it truly was. Uh, we're on the third generation where we started actually making money. Yeah. And then we went on the fourth generation to make it truly cloud, right? Cloudified. Right. And we wrote it from scratch. Because what everybody did is take the shit they had and be spoke and put it in the cloud. Guys, lift and shift is not cloudifying. Right. It's getting that elasticity. It's getting that N plus one survivability. There's a bunch of features, so we can lie to each other and saying I'm cloud centric, just like when NFV came up in 2014. Oh, I'm NFV. Yeah. yeah, I have one service per farm. Right. Okay, like WTF. If you have one service <laughs> per farm, you haven't done much, right? <laughs> right. Like you haven't really leveraged the whole notion of virtualizing the service, yeah. being able to do one to many. But but I, I'd say you hit the nail on the head. Uh, I blame us for defining the competition criteria to beat a service that exists. Right. That's why the best service to beat the service is service itself. We never redefined the arena saying, well, it's IPTV. Yeah. Phil can watch it in any room on any device. It's not yeah. from one central location. We never took advantage. It took us a while to get, that's why Media Room was so successful with Microsoft. Yeah. Whole home PVR, it wasn't a feature. It never How stupid st is it not to put the storage in one place and watch the movie anywhere you want in the house? Yeah. So that's one. And the other one is the content. Uh, like, I don't know the rest of the world, but we're here, we're very reliant on Hollywood type content. And, mm -hmm. uh, they weren't terribly excited the way they cut it. Mm -hmm. Like, a lot of them now, like, so in Canada, I pay aggregators. So we did not get into, we did not diversify by buying American content rights. Right. We actually are just a user, we pass through the cost. But the whole construct is stupid. Like, why can't I just buy a channel? So my mother visits. She's a, very religious. She wants the church channel, whatever the hell the equivalent is around the world. Sure, yeah. I got to buy it for a month for my mother visiting for a day. I love her. I'd rather take her to church, donate 100 bucks to the church. <laughs> That's right. Which they have benefit from than paying 30 bucks to set up a channel Yeah. for a day, right? So, so Phil, does a, we have to look at the whole supply chain and ecosystem. Yeah, we haven't gotten there yet. Yeah, because the because it seems like even when the technology allows us to do stuff, either the content or the suppliers kind of trip us up along the way. Um, I like what you said about AI though. It seems like there is potential for AI untapped potential to kind of go back through and, um, make right some of the things, you know, optimize what, what we're spending our time on, I guess, inside of networks and that sort of thing. Um, so that, that'll be interesting. Um, do you see, what are your other, uh, uh, do you have any other big, uh, aspirations for what telcos could do with AI? I think, so there's the basic optimize, you know, like in the old days, you used to phone one vendor, now you have 38 vendors to make a session work. Yeah. So I think that whole coordination, there's a lot of uh, digital, but manually managed areas, right? So I think that's what AI needs to look at. 
uh, not to make decisions because Eric says there's no freaking way I'm going to let AI decide which trunk is coming down. Guys, we're not there yet. Like there's multiple phases. Like if you think of AI as a toddler, like everybody uses it, then they want to be all of a sudden they want to graduate with a PhD for university. You just told me it's a toddler. <laughs> so how are they growing and how are you growing them, right? So, so I think yeah. uh, the basic step is, uh, you know, in the old days when they put everything electronically, that doesn't mean it's digital. And now that they're digital, that doesn't mean it's they're, they're digitized versus they're digital. So I think you need to uh, get AI to manage the complexity of our supply chain. Yeah. Uh, so where you used to call a Nortel or an Ericsson or a Samsung or a Huawei, now you have to call Huawei and it's 18 software suppliers or Ericsson and it's 20 software suppliers. So who's going to synchronize the testing? We still kind of, we do it brute force. So I thought the AI has a huge role to play. Mm -hmm. And the other one is if I have 5,000 client plans, how can AI lump them? So maybe it's could be end up from 5,000 to four. So right. that erosion of technical debt today is, what's similar, what's not. So what's the best way? And then, you know, let's weaponize AI to call those people that apply here, saying, well, listen, I'm going to change your plan slightly. Dollars won't change because we're sensitive to dollar. But that feature that you've never used, I'm going to take it away. Is that okay? Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's okay. Thank you so much. You're wonderful. Here, let me give you a little star, a tell a star. Maybe every 10 tell us stars, you get something else. So that's what I mean by using AI uh, proactively, to help us are with our transformation, I think it's a very critical piece. Yeah, I I I, I totally uh, uh, I think that's a great direction for the industry to go, and uh, uh, and that's a great place to leave this because uh, I did promise you we'd, we'd wrap it up after thirty. Uh, thank you, uh, Brahim Gideon, so much for uh, for taking the time. Now that you have nothing but time, and and can't and and probably shouldn't be bothered by journalists, but. Uh, thanks, thanks for spending some time no, with you're me. You're a friend. Thank you, Phil, for having me. All right. <laughs> Ciao. Bye.